Marco Barbarigo. Although his brother Agostino was destined for greatness, Marco left his mark on Venetian history as well. A tyrant since he was barely old enough to walk, whatever Marco wanted, he got. There are records here for jewels, entire fleets of ships, all paid for by his family and all ordered directly from him. And then there's his personal life. Apparently, Marco's wife, Carlotta, used to be married to his bodyguard, Dante Moro. Dante was captain of the city guard, an heir to one of the most prestigious families in Venezia. Marco was supposedly his close friend, right? But get this, Marco decides he wants Carlotta. In the Catholic religion, marriages till death do us part, and Marco's a good Catholic. So, he hires a hit on Dante. Dante gets stabbed three times in the body, and once in the head. But he doesn't die. He recovers with severe brain damage. Dante becomes like a child. So, what does Marco do? Well, he hires Dante as his personal bodyguard, and he gets him to sign a confession annulling the marriage. Marco takes Carlotta, and keeps Dante as his personal slave. What a lovely fella. My love, I wonder if ever the day will come when these words might make sense to you once more. I am sorry for what I've done, and for what you and I have both become. Though we could not be together, just knowing you were near was enough. And now, with Marco dead, I may yet find a way for us to be joined again. But, do you even remember me? Or were the wounds too grave? Do my words stir, if not your memory, then your heart? It doesn't matter what they say. I know you're still in there, somewhere. I will find a way, my love, to remind you, to restore you. Love always, Carlotta. Jacopo di Pazzi, the money. This guy was the head of the Pazzi family, and he ran their banking business. An associate of Lorenzo de' Medici, he had nothing against him personally. So he hired four Templar hitmen to take care of the situation for him. Bernardo di Bandino Baroncelli. Brought up to hate the Medici family for the exile of his cousins, Baroncelli ran the numbers in the Pazzi bank by day and murdered for the Templars at night. It was Baroncelli who delivered the first blow. Stefano de Bagnone. Known for his cruelty, Bagnone was trained in Rome as a Templar butcher. It was Bagnone who stabbed Lorenzo de' Medici in the back. Antonio Maffei. Witness to the sacking of Volterra by Florentine mercenaries, Maffei blamed Lorenzo. He joined the Templars to seek revenge. It was Maffei who slashed Lorenzo's neck. Archbishop Francesco Salviati. Convinced he would be the next Archbishop of Florence, Salviati was enraged when Lorenzo stood in his way. But the Templars were there to heal his wounds. It was Salviati who marched their troops into the city. Maestro, it's with fear in my heart that I write this letter. The prophet has arrived, I feel it. The birds don't act as they should. They swirl around the location, I see them from my tower. I will not attend our meeting as asked. I can't expose myself like this, or the demon might find me. Forgive me, for I am only listening to my voice. May the father of understanding guide you, guide me. Brother A. Francesco di Pazzi. Brought up as a noble in a city captivated by the newly rich Medici family, Francesco was taught to hate the middle class and its social climbers. Dismayed, he watched as the Medici bank eclipsed his own and centuries of influence over the Florentine government slipped away. It looks like the Spaniard offered him a solution. Rather than compete in something as dirty as banking, Francesco only had to do one thing for the Templars. One thing to put the middle class in their place for good. Kill the Medici. 
Giovanni Auditore tried to stop Francesco by putting him in jail. But the Templars took care of that. Kecko and Ludovico Orsi. Bored with their leisurely life in the countryside, the Orsi brothers decided to spice things up a little. They started a money-lending business that was extremely successful, mostly because they killed anyone who didn't pay them back. Then, Caterina Sforza hired them to murder her Templar husband, Girolamo Riario, which they did in true cavalier fashion. They rode up to his palace, waltzed into the dining room, stabbed him in the chest, ransacked the estate, and left his naked body in the center of town. According to Abstergo's files, Rodrigo Borgia, after escaping from Venice, offered to pay them for the recapture of the Peace of Eden. And, of course, Caterina's head. It was the Orsi brothers' idea to kidnap her children. I ask you, what has this world come to when the rich go so bad? Girolamo Savonarola, a Dominican friar from Ferrara, this man took his job seriously. He saw the excesses of his age, the rich stomping the poor into the dirt, the priests selling indulgences to the populace, and he went insane. Calling himself an instrument of God, Savonarola descended on Frenze. His sermons sent people into frenzies. He demanded an end to all personal property, to all progress, a return to Eden. Knowledge became the enemy, and he could erase it all with the piece of Eden at his command. Books, paintings, musical instruments, he burned everything in the bonfire of the vanities. History unraveled as his legions took control, and Firenze descended into darkness. Carlo Grimaldi. Emerging from his palace in Monaco with a craving for political power, Carlo quickly became a key guest at the tables of Venetian nobility. While his reputation for discretion earned him entrance into the back rooms. Here's how the old bastard ended up in the Council of Ten. While visiting the head of the council, Ignacio Contarini, Carlo ran into Ignacio's daughter. Desperate for help and aware of Carlo's trustworthy reputation, she confided in him. Her father had arranged her marriage, but she wanted to run away with the son of one of the servants. They'd been in love since they were children, and they planned to start a new life in Milan where they could be free of her father. Carlo suggested immediate action, an escape by ship that night. The two lovers followed his instructions, and as they climbed the gangplank, they were free. That is until Ignazio appeared on deck. Carlo was rewarded for his loyalty to the Contarini family. While true love, well, see for yourself. Sylvia. Babarigo. Raised by wealthy merchants, Silvio was introduced to politics when his father was cut out of the family inheritance. From then on, Silvio worked for his uncle, his father's killer. Apparently, he had a knack for persuasion. Quickly, he became his uncle's advisor, proving his worth by discovering a Saranzo plot against the Barbarigos. You're going to love this. Before the plot could be carried out, Silvio throws an Easter celebration, inviting the Saranzos. There's a pageant for the children in the central courtyard, while Silvio escorts the parents to the roof. He toasts the family, then signals the archers hidden behind the courtyard windows. The Saranzos never plotted against the Barbarigos again. Fast forward ten years, and Silvio's living in his uncle's luxurious Venetian palazzo. According to the history books, his uncle died in bed. <laughs> Ra
Rodrigo Borgia, a.k.a. the Spaniard. A dark stain on human history, Rodrigo left a trail of blood a mile wide on his quest to unify Italy under the Templar banner. Anyone who opposed him ended up in little pieces inside a sack, or, if he was in a good mood, poisoned. Once he was crowned Pope, Rodrigo, or should I say Alexander VI, used his influence to wage war with any city that held out against the Templars. And then there were the rumoured X-rated atrocities. Hundreds of courtesans brought to the Vatican by the cartload and the Pope's close friendship with his illegitimate daughter, Lucrezia. Oh yeah, and did I mention the killings never stopped? Throughout all his public debauchery, Rodrigo was quietly murdering his enemies behind the scenes, consolidating Templar power for the moment when they would seize control.